uh, yeah, so uh, we'll talk about question answering. Uh, it's kind of true, as Shimon said, said, I won't go into details in the presentation, but I'm kind of have a side project of answering questions about board game rules. Uh, so this is kind of, uh, I'm interested in question answering because of my side project, but this will be pretty general, although deep dive into how to build a retrievers for question answering. And uh, this is probably something many people are not familiar with, but I will go into details what does it mean exactly? So uh, let's start with question answering and in particular with open domain question answering. So we basically have some question like who is the bad guy in Lord of the Rings? And question answering is the task of NLP that deals with answering automatically to questions asked in natural language. So we have such question and we want to do some NLP magic to get the answer. So pretty straightforward. And open domain pretty much means that questions can be from any domain. This is not exactly true because usually when we have some particular data set, some particular task, we are forced to work within some domain. For example, board game questions. But in practice, usually some factoid questions like from Wikipedia, news questions, and so on, so on. But in general, you just want to ask any questions and get an answer. And recently, there has been proposed an architecture, maybe somehow general framework, how to deal with how to build such system. It's called retrieve and read architecture. And all starts with some data source, some knowledge base. For example, for factoid question, it can be Wikipedia. So we have a lot of knowledge, encyclopedic knowledge. We can split our articles into passages. So we have a lot of passages containing some knowledge. For English Wikipedia, it's around 20 million passages. So in the next step, we want to index those passages somehow to make it easier for our search. And then when we have a question, we encode this question in the same way, in such a way maybe that it's easy to search the index for some relevant passages, hopefully the passages that will answer those questions. We retrieve top K such passages and we hope that they will contain the answer, but they are not the answer such because they are well, passages. They have few sentences and maybe in those passages there is an answer. We have to extract this answer. And the second step therefore is reader that will read those passages. It will read the question and extract the answer. Uh, and today we will deal only with this part. So how to retrieve relevant passages. And this retrieval part is pretty similar to search problem, but with one significant difference that you don't exactly search for similar questions, like, but for evidence containing the answer. So there are two distinct uh, domains and not exactly the same, for example, token overlap or something like this. So in practice, you usually encode those passages in inverted index and use something like DM25 uh, to extract passages. This is the typical algorithm from Elasticsearch, for example. So you just look at some kind of TFIDF, but basically back of world approach to extract passages that has similar tokens that the question. And for a reader, you use some kind of model based on that. 
but there is a problem with sparse retrievals like VM25. The obvious problem, you probably can guess what is it, that you don't always have the token overlap. So in our question, we have a bad guy, but in passage, especially from Wikipedia, we probably don't have the term bad guy, but we will have something like villain or enemy or something like that. And obviously, if we just compare those two texts with some simple back of word approach, you probably won't find it. And we need to find this passage because it will contain the answer. So the natural uh, approach to solve this would be to use something like dense retriever. So try represent those two texts in a similar embedding space. This is pretty obvious to do, but actually it has been done only like two years ago in a way that it's actually better than VM25. So it was not that straightforward to do. So the new type of architecture, or maybe implementation of such architecture, is to use dense, dense models. And instead of VM25 and using words to embed the, the passages and the question, we use neural network as a passage encoder, as a question encoder. We store the encoded passages in a, usually files or some other engine to approximate k nearest neighbors. And to search for relevant passages, we encode the question and use those KNN to search for top most similar passages. And then we'll just use again the same verb to extract the answer. So the question is, how can we train it? And what are the problems and issues? And basically what have we, what do we need to uh, take care of? Uh, so as the encoders, we pretty much can use BERT model or some other transformer-based model. It doesn't matter really. We have a question. We encode this question with, with BERT. We take, for example, embedding for CLS token, and it will be our embedding for the question. We'll take usually another BERT and do exactly the same with passage. And we will have the embedding for a passage. And now, obviously, we want to train such model that those two embeddings will be similar if the passage is matching, it's relevant to the question, or this similar if it's not. So we'll calculate the similarity as a simple dot product this way, it's easy for files to search for similar passages. And to train it, we will just use negative log likelihood. Again, pretty straightforward. Uh, we just want to optimize the, the positive passages. So passages relevant to the question will have high similarity and not relevant so negatives will have low similarity. Uh, so I've introduced the notion of positives and negatives, so relevant passages and irrelevant passages. And typically in the data set, you will have a question and you will have a positive passage and answer obviously, but you don't have any negatives because what does it mean actually? Every other passage is a negative. But actually, if you've done any metric learning, you probably know that choosing the right negatives is crucial for everything to work. And it's again here also crucial. So what can you do? 
we can just take any random passage from our knowledge base as a negative, and that's all. So let's say here that we have uh, we train such model. We choose random negatives from the whole Wikipedia. We have seven negatives in a batch. And we get such results. So we have, for example, top 20 accuracy, let's look at this, 64%. Then you can be somewhat smart, let's say, because those random negatives are pretty simple. Since they are random, that model for model it's trivial to discriminate whether this is matching or not matching the question. So we can do something smarter, search for harder negatives and actually use BM25 because it doesn't need any training to search for a passage, the most matching, most relevant passage for a given question but only choose those passages that doesn't contain the answer because we have the answer. So if we do that, we will have a really similar, really relevant passage, but it will be not correct passage because it doesn't contain the answer. So what can we see here? That it's not actually better. The intuition is that it's actually too difficult because model during training only sees those hard negatives and they are so hard that model cannot learn anything useful. Uh, and the third type of negatives is actually just the implementation trick. You also random a passage but not from the whole Wikipedia, but only from the training set. So the training set consists of question, passage, and answer. And so we have pretty much limited number of passages, like usually 50,000 or something like this, comparing to 20 million from Wikipedia. So it's easier to sample from from this and it will be useful in the next slide. But if we use only these gold uh, passages, some from the training set, the results again are kind of lower than random, but pretty much similar. Lower probably because we have less of those negatives. So model will see less uh, diverse pool of negatives. But we can do a simple trick. It's called in batch negatives. So if we train a model and we have, for example, eight questions in a batch, then for each question, we will have one positive passage. And as a negative passages, we will all we'll use all the remaining positive passages from other remaining questions. So we only put to the batch eight questions, eight passages. And so for a question one, the first passage will be a positive, but any other passage will be a negative. Why is it cool? Because it's more efficient because the most computationally expensive part obviously will be to calculate the embedding for a question or for a passage and in this approach you just once calculate the embeddings for a passages for eight passages and reuse them for each question as a negative it's cool because in this way you can actually not have a seven negatives, but seven times eight negatives, because each negative will be used several times. And it actually 
kind of improves the quality. For me, this ablation study is not really perfect because it doesn't say what will happen if we choose more negatives, but not use them all the time. Or even what if we have those seven times eight negatives, but from random, will it be comparable or not? But this way it's really efficient. So people just do it like that. And since it's efficient, you can increase the batch size. And if you increase the batch size, you are also increasing uh, by the power of two, the number of negatives. And it actually has a dramatic effect for the accuracy. This is actually top 20 retrieval accuracy on natural questions. Natural questions is a data set, popular data set for question answering, basically. So the uh, lesson learned uh, that we can efficiently use, reuse the negatives from within the batch. And the more passages we have, the more negative passages we have, the better the model is. So this is the first trick. And the second trick is that if we actually add now these hard negative, just one hard negative for each question, we will get another boost and pretty significant boost. If we get one additional negative, so one negative for each question, we'll get the boost of like eight percentage point. If we get two, it actually lower the results. And again, if we have a higher batch size, it's even better. So second lesson, we should use hard negatives. So the question is, okay, that's cool, but is it actually better than BM25? And if it's better, then it's not necessarily useful in practice because you can, let's say, train BM25 without any training data. And for training, such birth model, you probably need a lot of uh, examples, but this is actually not true. So the authors of the paper uh, compared BM25, it would be in blue, with different sizes of training set. So the orange will use only 1,000 examples, then green 10,000 and so on. And this is accuracy, and this is how many passages do we retrieve? And as you can see, BM25 is the poorest. And even with 1,000 examples, you can beat BM25 and get the better results. And obviously, the more data we have, the better the quality of the retriever. And there are diminishing returns after a while, it doesn't really matter that much how much data do you have. So that's cool news to me because 1,000 examples is pretty small. You can actually do it in a day, probably yourself, and you will get a better model than BM25. Okay, so the authors also as poses the question, what if we don't have passages in training set? Because that sometimes happen that you only have data set consisting of question and answer. This was, for example, the case in recent poll level competition. Uh, there was a competition for Polish question answering and you also only get question and answer. And they devised such approach that you use BM25 to retrieve top one passage and see if this passage contains the answer. If it does contain the answer, then you use this pair of question and passage 
as a positive and train the model on this. And surprisingly, it works really well. So the gold is the model we talked about. And this approach is called distance supervision. And you actually got pretty similar results. OK, so to conclude this difference between sparse OBM25 approach and dense approach, we can look at the qualitative results. And there are two conclusions here. First is, if we have a question that is difficult to answer because of the, let's say, unusual usage of terms, like what is the body of water between England and Ireland, if we use the BM25, you will find the article about British cycling because there are a lot of England, Ireland, and body terms, but obviously it's not useful. But if we have a dense retriever, you will see a C term because it will be similar in embedding space to the body of water. So that's great for the PR. However, if we have a question with specific and pretty rare term, like Tauros of Mir in Game of Thrones, those kinds of questions will be extremely easy for BM25 to find the correct passage because it just needs to search for this term. And this term is really rare. Then we have high probability that if we return any passage with this term, it will be a correct one. And it actually is. However, for DPR, it cannot learn some such rare terms. Obviously, you won't have them in a dictionary, but also you just don't see them during the training. So it will just return something that is not relevant. So the question is, can we do a hybrid approach and somehow use both of these approaches to our advantage? And the proposal is as follows. Let's retrieve top 200, uh, 2000, sorry, passages, 2000 from BM25, 2000 from the passage retriever, and then re-rank them using basically the weighted average of scores between BM25 score and the similarity score from the passage retriever. It makes sense, right? If we have such great results, sometimes for DPR, we'll get great results from DPR. If not, we'll get from BM25. And if we compare the results, it's actually not that great. Here we will have DPR. We have five different data sets. And sometimes the results for hybrid retrieval is worse, sometimes similar worse, a little better, a lot of better, but kind of inconclusive. And another question that you might ask, okay, if we have like five data sets for question answering, can we just train one retriever to rule them all and use it? We have more data. We saw that more data is better. Maybe if we use all data sets, it will also be better. So why not? And we compare a single, so separate retrieval for each data set, a multi one retriever trained on all data set, including squat, because squat is pretty specific, because it only uses a small subset of passages, like 500, and reuses those passages for multiple questions. So it kind of doesn't work that well to train a retriever on this. So when we look at the data, we see that, yeah, it kind of helps. 
a little help, a little worse. Here, a lot better, especially for track or squat, it's worse. And if we look, why does it help for those two data sets? We can see that web questions and track are actually the ones that have the smallest data set, training data set. So obviously it will help, maybe not obviously, but it will help if we have a lot more data, but maybe some domain mismatch. But for those bigger data sets, it kind of is enough to just have those data sets. It doesn't matter that much that we will have like two times as many training examples because two times is not that huge of a difference, but it will cause some mismatch in domains because those questions will be kind of different. Okay, but this is only probably only because those increase of the training size, training set size is not that huge, only two or three times bigger. What if we have a lot, a lot, a lot more training examples? So this is the question asked in next paper, domain match pre-training, a task for dense retrieval. What if we use something called PAC data set and pre-train the retrieval on that? PAC is a data set that consists of 65 million synthetic questions answer pairs. They are generated automatically from Wikipedia. And well, this is a lot like 65 million comparing to like 60,000 training examples. So maybe the benefit will be there. Uh, and actually it is. So uh, they compared the standard DPR. So this 78% with a model that is first trained on those 65 synthetic question answer pairs and then fine tuned on natural questions. And what we can see that there is a huge increase, five percentage point thanks to this pre-training. And this is consistent across different case, different data sets and also different base models whether this is blurred base or blurred large. If you do pre-training, you will have higher results. So again, this is probably not that surprising, but good to know that, that if you can, you should pre-train your model. Here you can see what is the relation between the size of pre-training data. So how much data do we add? and what is the accuracy. So pretty much what you expected, the more data, the better, except well, probably some not statistically, if, uh, not statistically significant results here, but the general trend is pretty obvious. Okay, so we have the third paper, the rocket QA. And here the, answer, the uh, authors identify several challenges in training DPRs. And the first one is the discrepancy between training and inference. So their idea is, okay, listen, if we train a model, we only use like 128 negatives or something like this per positive. And this is pretty small, right? Because during inference, we have one question and 20 ma 21 million passages in our knowledge base. So it doesn't really compare like those 100 negatives during training and 20 million during inference. So we probably should have more negatives during training. We saw that more negatives during training uh, helps. So maybe we can scale it somehow. 
and we can uh, if they tested how many negatives can we get per uh, data set per, uh, sorry per batch uh, per question in batch that we can see that clear advantage if we have those 128 we get some result 27 mrr this is the uh, ms marco data set not natural questions so the results are smaller and the metric is different but it doesn't really matter but we can see that if we get higher number of random negatives then the results will be higher up to some point when we will have a decrease so this is cool so how can we do this efficiently uh, so they devised the notion of cross-batch random negatives. Uh, remember previously we had uh, in-batch random negatives, so we reuse the negatives from other positives. So other positive passages, we use them as a negatives for other questions, uh, but it doesn't scale because you have limited memory on uh, one GPU. So you have limited memory to put uh, questions and passages, basically. And you cannot scale and put more uh, those passage question pairs more than the GPU uh, suffice. But we can train with multiple GPUs, obviously. But you still have those in-batch negatives within one GPU card but they devise the notion okay so when we compute the embeddings on each gpu let's then synchronize all those embeddings and calculate the similar similarity matrix that will reuse all those embeddings from all gpus and therefore scale the number of negatives it's not something amazing, to be honest. I mean, okay, it will scale the number of negatives by a constant, depending on how many GPUs you have, but it's something. And actually you can see that the improvement is not that significant. But the second idea is pretty cool. Uh, so they observed that we have a lot of unlabeled positives in our data set. It means that if we train a retriever and then retrieve some passages, for example, on this MS Marco data set, then for a 70% of top retrieved passages, those passages, even though in a training set, they are not labeled as a positive, they are actually positive. So this is not something surprising, right? Because for a given question, you only have one positive passage, but this passage might be also relevant to multiple other questions because passage is like 100 or 200 characters so it will contain a lot of information right and people can ask those questions uh, for those informations but it means that you cannot easily use those passages as a hard negatives you remember that in original dpr paper they filtered out those passages that contain the answer to our question and didn't use them and this is cool trick but for me first it kind of cheating but second most important it might not always work especially for polish for example when you have the inflation and you will have some synonyms and you will have some strange construction of sentences that okay you won't have the answer directly in a question but only because it's it has the answer but it's a synonym for example so 
they decided that that they will solve it another way. And the approach is as follows. So first, let's train a dual encoder. Dual encoder is the architecture that we talked about. So separate encoder for question, separate encoder for passage, and we are training those encoders to the dot product similarity between positive question and passage. And we train this model and use it to retrieve top K passages from the knowledge base. And then we, on the same training set, we train a cross encoder. So cross encoder is pretty different in a sense that we concatenate question and passage and train the model to identify if this is a matching, uh, matching passage or not. So it will be maybe not obviously, but obviously kind of better because you can have a cross attention between all tokens. In here, you can have only cross attention within passage and within question. And here you can attend to from tokens of question to attend to passage. And it usually is a lot of better, but you cannot use it in practice because during the inference, it will be extremely expensive because you would have to for 20 million passages in Wikipedia. And given question, you would have to make a 20 million predictions by concatenating this one question to every passage and make a prediction. Like you, you wouldn't be able to do this. That's why we use dual encoder. But if we train cross encoder, you can actually look at those top retrieved passages from dual encoder and filter out any positives and keep only the negative passages. And if we have those negative passages, that they are pretty great, right? Because they are considered as uh, positives from dual encoder, and we are training our dual encoder. But they are not positive because our more powerful cross encoder said so. So probably they are actually not uh, not positives. And the authors make a manual verification, and they said that this cross encoder is 90% accurate. So let's assume it is. So we will have some noise, but not that much. And you can use those negatives basically to train the model. So cool idea. Let's see how it works. And Without any hard negatives, we have this 69 recall at five on natural question. If we use hard negatives without denoising, so just using those top passages, we have worse results actually, 68%. But if we do denoising, we get 73%, so four percentage point improvement. Basically, for for free because we don't do anything here. We don't annotate new data and so on. So pretty cool. Uh, obviously there is a natural question here uh, for a request for one new ablation study. What happens if we use this cross encoder as a, red, as a ranker? So why cannot we retrieve the passages from dual encoder? but retrieve 10 times more and use a cross encoder to do the ranking and then see what is the recall at five. Probably it will be similar, at least that's my guess. Uh, it's a shame that authors didn't do this, but obviously it will have, it is the advantage that you use only the one encoder 
because you don't have to do re-ranking. It's simpler architecture and it's faster. So again, kudos for the idea. And you can again see uh, what is the relation between number of random negatives uh, with and without hard negatives. So again, even if we have hard negatives, then we have huge boost in accuracy in MRR in this plot, sorry. Uh, but also if we have more negatives, it's better up to some point. Uh, just to show you one thing, uh, the authors of the first paper use this 128 negatives. Those authors use 4,000. So they will obviously have the higher results. So, okay, the first idea and the first, first challenge and the idea is that label data is expensive and well, it costs money to prepare and to label the data set. So there are only a few of them and they cover only a few topics, even though the open domain QA should be about any domain, it's kind of hope that it will work in any domain, but it doesn't transform that well. So if we want to have a model that actually works for our domain, we have to have some label data set and we don't because it's expensive to annotate those. So what's the idea to solve this? Well, first let's gather some unlabeled data and they gathered 1.7 million unlabeled questions for Yahoo Answer, Orcas and MRQA. So they have only questions and nothing else. And they pretty much do the same trick as in previous slides. So retrieve top passages from dual encoder trained on our labeled data sets. So, okay, we have some top scoring passages and then label those passages using cross encoder because we know that cross encoder is more powerful. And if we have those uh, pseudo labels, we can then fine tune our retriever on both the manual, this original data set, this label data set, and this predictive data set. So for me, it's kind of the same idea as pre training on PAC. So PAC was this synthetically generated data set. Here again, they are kind of creating synthetically the data set and retrain on this. And it again helps not that much, only one percentage point, uh, probably because they only have 1.7 million data set, uh, sorry, examples in data set, comparing to the 65 million in pack. And probably the quality is lower because after all you are kind of doing the distilled uh, learning from cross encoder to dual encoder and cross encoder won't be 100% uh, accurate. Uh, and what we can see, what is the function of uh, accuracy, recover MRR, uh, given the number of additional training examples, well, pretty much the more the better, again. Uh, so going to the conclusions, I've talked about three models, the classic DPR, DPR fine-tuned additionally on pack, and this rocket QA. Uh, as for negatives, you remember DPR used in batch, uh, sampling of negatives, rocket QA used cross batch, actually DPR pack also used this cross batch approach and had bigger batch. For hard negatives, DPR, both DPRs used top scoring passages from BM25, but used answer filtering. So you filtered out 
the, the passages that contain the answer. And Rocket QA uses this cross encoder to filter out the, the positives, the unlabeled positives. And this is a really cool idea. I will really repeat myself, sorry, but it actually makes a lot of sense because first, it's cool that you use dual encoder here because you are directly fixing the mistakes done by, by your dual encoder. In here, you are using something that we know isn't that powerful and fixing those mistakes. And I mean, why exactly? We know that we want to fix our dual encoder mistakes, not VM25 mistakes. And using cross encoder obviously is the less accurate method than answer filtering, but it's actually more general, especially if we think about questions like in this recent Polypa competition, there were a lot of binary questions. So something like, is it true that Sauron was the villain in Lord of the Rings? And the answer is yes. And for such questions, you cannot use this answer filtering because you won't find, like, yeah, uh, probably you will find a yes in the passage or in Polish tag, but it doesn't really matter that the passage is correct or incorrect. So this idea is much more general and can be applied to a wider range of questions, not only simple factoidal questions or some named entities. Uh, as for additional data, in DPR, they didn't use any. In PAC, they used those 65 million synthetic pairs. And in Rocket QA, they use 1.7 million pseudo labels. The last difference I didn't mention before is that Rocket QA, uh, it was done by guys from Baidu, I guess, and they use their Ernie based model. It's actually a little better than BERT. They've done some uh, ablation study, but overall, the best results are obtained by this DPR pack. My guess is mostly because of this additional data. So, few lessons learned. That's a recap random negatives, the more the better. We saw this in two papers in DPR in Rocket QA. As for hard negatives, again, you have to use them. You will have a huge boost, but you have some way to filter out unlabeled positives. And again, the more but the more data, the better. If you can find somehow the additional data to do the pre-training, either synthetic ones on the pseudo labels or maybe something else. Maybe you have some weekly label data set. It's probably wise to use them as it usually helps. And that's all. Thank you for listening and I will be happy to take some questions. We have one. Thank you first for, for, for the talk. That was uh, very, very interesting. And also, I think it, it, it will be useful for us in our, in our work. Uh, we have one question in the QA panel. Can you see it or sh should I read it to you? Uh, one second. Oh, OK, it's here. Uh, what experience do you have with preparing text passages? Specifically, I'm concerned with two problems. First one is the context of the answer, which can be often quite short. And second one is quite high complexity as you have to compare the query with every possible passage. Okay, so the first question, uh, how long should be the passage basically? Uh, Usually, it depends, obviously, but usually it's not a problem that those passages 
will be too long to fit to belt. They are more like maximum few hundreds examples, but usually like uh, 50 tokens or something like this. And you actually can pack a lot of passages into one, let's say, context or pseudo passage just by concatenation of several passages and put it to BERT. So this is usually not a problem. And there are a few techniques. Uh, some authors, as far as I saw, uh, just directly cut, for example, 100 uh, tokens, and that's all. Some prefer to do the whole sentences. Some cut at 100 tokens and do the overlapping passages. Uh, at the end, I think it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, and as for the second question, uh, you are right that it would be uh, complex to compare this embedding for a question with every other embedding in our uh, database. But this is why you use FICE. So FICE or any other approximate nearest neighbors actually deal with that and it well, basically cluster the subspace of the uh, embeddings in such a way that you only compare with a few hundred examples and you have lower complexity than N, basically. I don't know a lot of details about this, but it works. Thanks. Uh, I, I have one question, which is maybe a bit naive. You, you showed this uh, graph with uh, uh, pack pre-training. So, mm -hmm. It's one slide back, I think. Oh, yeah. It, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, this yeah, one. This pack. <laughs> so uh, at zero pre-training size, uh, mm -hmm. It, it's but it, it's still not a uh, off the shelf bird model. It's trained on your. Yeah, obviously. Uh, yes. Yeah, so so that's that's my question. How, how bad would it be if you uh, just took uh, off the shelf sentence encoder like sentence bird, and used that for uh, passage retrieval? Would it oh, be really uh, bad, or uh, or is it just you know that mm -hmm. you want to squeeze every bit of? Okay. So. Uh... So this is my experience. Uh, it's not that bad, basically, if we use, but it has to be pre-trained for similarly, like, for example, sentence BERT, not the typical BERT, because typical yeah. BERT will work terribly. But if you use sentence BERT, it's decent. Obviously, it's not that good, but it's decent. I actually, for the, Polyval competition. Uh, I used universal sentence encoder okay. as a retriever and also sentence bird and also some other uh, models. It didn't work great. It worked okay, but I used it to generate the data to annotate manually. So I basically used these zero shot models for a question to generate top 10 passages and I manually verified which of them are okay. And then use this manually labeled data set to train the proper retriever, but it was working. I mean, for every question in a top 10, I usually find at least one uh, correct or kind of correct passage. So, oh, yeah, thanks. What, what is the intuition? Uh, why why uh, training sentence bird or, or universal sentence encoder on <clears throat> specifically on the on the retrieval task? Why, why does it help? What what's, uh, what does this model learn? Can, can okay, you, uh, do you have I any? Would say that it's difficult to say what does it mean that two two texts are similar. Like, okay. uh, so if you have a sentence bird, 
it has one notion what does it mean to be similar and it sometimes it will be enough and you will find a correct passage but usually it's not exactly this notion of being similar especially like for comparing questions and passages they are they talk about the same thing but they are two sides uh, basically because in one you don't have this answer and in second you have this answer and you have in one only one sentence one question and for passage you have usually several sentences and they are not questions but on a shallow level they are really dissimilar okay so so, so this is not like you're looking for a paraphrase but yeah, rather yeah, for a complementary exactly. sentence yeah exactly and and, and then nice way of that, putting this. Yes. yeah this is your notion of like similarity yeah okay yeah i see Uh, we have some more questions uh, in the chat. chat there. Uh, Piotr, I'm not sure if you can see them. Okay. Yeah, I think I can. Uh, okay. Have you done tests on Polish data? Uh, yeah, so me and also a few other people took part in uh, this poll level competition on question answering. Uh, and it kind of works. Uh, I know that. Uh, some people use just BM25. Actually, the winner of the competition used BM25 at, and won mostly because he had a great reader, much better than any other. Uh, the second place, I trained uh, the DPR on manually labeled data, and there was Execo, the other team that also trained the DPR, but using this distance supervision, and it also works for them. So it works. That's all I can say. Uh, if you are curious, there is a proceeding on the Poleval website, and there are a lot more details. Uh, so the second question was, if we want to develop a QA model for a specific domain, and have only a small data set with labels is transfer learning possible from existing existing models yeah i, I think say, i think it's like if you have a, a 100 examples uh, if you have 100 i would definitely use it as a validation set not to do any training on this uh, but definitely you can just take all available data sets for retrieval for question answering and train a, a model on this like this multi data set, set approach or use this distance supervision obviously depending on the domain but i would try in this distance supervision if you have any answer if you don't just take off the shelf model it should work Uh, and comparing PM25 and doc 2 vec I would say doc 2 vec does, doesn't work. At least that's my experience. Uh, and there are of the shelf models that works okay, like universal sentence encoder or sentence bird. They are okay if you don't have data. Obviously, if you have data, it will work much better. And Honestly, I would also always try to annotate some data because really annotating a thousand passages is a day work. If you sit for a week, you will have a few thousand and it will be enough to train something much better than zero shot. We have one more question in the QA. Uh, do you have any conclusions from the use of QA solutions for in the case of queries for numbers, for example, in which year? So I, I think this is uh, about specific type of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, I don't. And that's the short answer, sorry. Okay. 
Thanks. Uh, Piotr, there is uh, one thing that I was wondering about when you showed this example uh, with uh, BM25 uh, combined uh, with like a similarity uh, metric. There is, it's a slide, uh, maybe uh, 10 slides ago. It was. Uh, yeah. This, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one, yeah. And then following uh, that. So, so you showed sort of two examples where one were um, uh, BM25 like uh, did poorly and one that uh, uh, where it did better. And then mm -hmm. there's, if you go to the next slide there, yeah, uh, that, that re-ranking thing. Um, are you aware of uh, any attempt of combining the two, but not setting the weights as fixed for all the queries, rather than try to sort of pre-classify the query? And this log looks like sort of BM25 lexical matching type of approach versus more like a sort of semantic matching. Mm, I haven't seen anything like this. Uh, to be honest, to this slide, I think the authors could do better. I mean, it really seems like you would like to compare it also to the cross encoder if you are doing any re-ranking, because probably it would work better. Because even if you cannot encode these rare tokens into the embedding, you probably can easily compare them across uh, passage and question. And this should be easier task and cross encoder should be able to, to do this. So I would, if I were to do the, the re-ranking, I would do the cross encoder here. So my, my intuition here would be like, we're coming from the e-commerce search query uh, environment and just looking at those queries, um, it seems that there is, there is a group that probably fits more mm -hmm. into BM25 word. And there's another group that would probably yeah, work. They better. are pretty much general queries. Yeah, the other approach would be, can we actually classify them? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, even not, if not like using ML, maybe with some heuristic like term frequency. Example. Uh, exactly. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, you, yeah. right. You're not familiar. Uh, uh, no, no, no. I'm not familiar with, with, with such works. Okay. Cool. But uh, this is actually those conclusions here are very similar to those I had on working on Palaval competition. It was mm -hmm. clearly seen that, yes, DPR works better at some general synonym matching. But if I had a kind of really specific uh, terms, it works poorly. Mm. And I was actually like using PM25 and DPR to generate ca candidates to, to manual uh, labeling. Or perhaps use one as a fallback for the other. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, the, the other thing is that we are talking about QA here, um, whereas we are dealing with pretty short queries, like sometimes extre extremely short. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Like we were talking, there was a question about the length of the passage, but what about the length of the query itself? I would say this is not a problem. I mean, this is problem in terms that in search engines you since you don't have a lot of tokens you pretty much don't know what the user is asking for because they don't give you enough information but this is not something that is problematic from the modeling perspective but rather you just don't have this information uh, so at least what is my knowledge about using such techniques in the e-commerce domain, it could work exactly the same way as it was described for question answering. Okay, thank you. But obviously it won't solve everything because yeah. the user just don't, is not giving enough information to us. 
Sure. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I think we don't have any more questions. So, uh, okay. Thanks. Thanks again. And uh, it was great to have you as a guest. And Thank you for inviting me. It was yeah. great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Bill. See you. See you. Bye.